It was a lot of fun. We got to go out and refuel with, uh, we ended up with five planned F-16s. And we flew down towards Holloman Air Force Base, which is where the flying training unit is for the F-16 schoolhouse. So we got to um, see a lot of people coming through as they're just beginning to learn and to really get a grip on their refueling skills while their um, instructor pilots were their lead as they came up in two ships. So the first instructor would come up and get their gas and kind of demo as the wingmen watched um, watched from, from nearby. And then it's always fun to listen to them come up and kind of hear what they're going through in their mind, but also let our boom operators really have an opportunity to shine as they're the ones um, on the crew that are in direct contact and conversation with those refu with those receivers as they come up to us. So, it's so inside is also um, a lot of moving pieces and a lot of teamwork happening. That's where, again, we're going through that checklist um, that leads us step by step of a check of pretty much everything in the front of the jet to make sure it's operational. Um, and good to go. Now, at the same time, while um, the co-pilot is going through that checklist in the front, the boom operator is either um, working at the table getting some of their um, air fueling paperwork complete, or they're actually at the back of the jet in the boom pod going through their checks as well, again, to all make sure that we are affecting a safe and successful sortie. We definitely try and breed that teamwork from the start, even at the jet while I'm outside doing one thing and while the co-pilot is on the inside doing their check, but it really begins even um, the day prior with paperwork and planning and making sure that we all have the same vision for the sortie and that things are going to happen. So we have our guys inside, guys and gals inside doing the paperwork. Then we show up at, at brief time. We're going through the big picture of the sortie and then moving out to the airplane again, staying on the same page and staying together. Um, everyone's goal, like I keep saying, is a safe and efficient sortie and getting, getting you home to whoever your person is um, when that jet lands that day. Major Susie Crespo and I'm a pilot. Well for me both my parents were Army National Guard and, and most of my family members were military as well but Army and I wasn't sure where I wanted to go to college. I grew up in Puerto Rico and I just knew I wanted to leave the island and get away from home from the nest. So my mom was the one who encouraged me to apply to the Air Force Academy and I went there but I had no no aspirations to be an aviator and then once I went to the Air Force Academy then it was like uh, Sarah said all the opportunities. There was the opportunity to do my private pilot's license there, and that's where I fell in love with aviation. I, start, I, I started flying, and of course, at the beginning, it's a little bit rough, but there was just one day I landed, and I walked away from the plane, and I was like, that was awesome. I could do that every day, and then I could get paid for it. <laughs> if I had to give a piece of advice, uh, I would say have your goal in mind, but then only chew on the very next piece. Uh, I feel like a lot of people get so overwhelmed with all the challenges if you just take on one at a time. The very next thing in front of you, work at that, and then as soon as you get past that, you can move on to the next one. And that's how I've actually gotten across the biggest hurdles in, in my career. And I've had plenty. I'm only five feet tall, so I'm way shorter than what is required uh, to be a pilot. And I just just worked on the next thing and worked on the next person and talked to you know each step of the way, only worried about the, the very next piece, and that helped me get to the bigger goals that I had. I have, I have two kids, a, a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and I think my two-year-old doesn't quite care yet, but my four-year-old is definitely super enthusiastic about it. Uh, I don't think he knows exactly what I do yet. I mean, he knows about the flying. We've been on a ton of commercial flights, so I think he assumes that what we do is like a commercial flight. We take off, and we go somewhere, and then we land, and he loves the airport, and he loves to watch the planes. And I, I can see that seeing me flying has been... I don't want to say inspirational to him, but eye-opening as well because he has this little plane set that he likes to play with and he opens it. And the plane set came with a male pilot, a female stewardess, and then a little baggage. And when he opened it, he was like, this is all wrong. And he like put the female in the pilot seat and they put right. the dude in the back and the, the bag. And I was like, that's right, babe. Good job. I've had a lot. I've had people come up to me and ask like, but how do you give gas to somebody in the air? Yeah, it's a and I'm like, well, we have a boom operator, so really, I just, I'm the bus driver. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Susie Jones, pilot. I was raised to be really independent and adventurous. 
But of course, being raised, you don't want to be like your parents at the beginning. So I, I wanted to be an artist, and I went to school for marketing and photography. And then one thing led to another, and then there were, were no more airplanes in the family and no more flying. And I realized, you know, once it's gone, how much I missed it. So in college, while I was doing college for marketing and design, I got my private pilot's license and decided this is way more fun than what's going on in the corporate world. And uh, lucky enough, uh, my stepfather, who was also a commercial pilot, uh, had uh, the skinny on going straight through reserves. So I uh, just interviewed all over, or reached out all over the country, did several interviews, and found a great unit, and haven't looked back since. I'm 20 years in uh, as a full-time reservist, and cool. love it. The skills that I've seen benefit people to succeed in the military and in aviation is discipline and responsibility. And you, ha you just have to be able to kind of roll with the punches, accept responsibility. If something goes wrong, it's a learning experience, it's not a failure, a uh, learning opportunity. So really you can study anything and I definitely encourage girls to study the STEM. They just weren't interests to me. Mm -hmm. uh, history as well, like half the people we work with seem to be history majors and yeah. to this day I'm still more a touchy-feely, artsy-fartsy person. But uh, the, the <laughs> skill set that serves, and of course we don't just fly airplanes, there's a lot of leadership and mentorship. There's just something about the little girls, Are they're curious and like if someone were to come up to me in my flight suit that was an adult and was like, wow, do you fly airplanes? I'm like, come on, get with the program. But a little girl, when they're like, wow, do you fly airplanes? You're like, heck yeah, I do, and you should too. And here's my card when you graduate, you know, come join the reserves. It's less predictable. Okay. We don't deploy as much. You don't have to deal with them moving every few years that active duty does. So they, uh, I don't have any active duty experience, but I know from looking in from the outside that it's a lot more challenging on family and those kinds of things. However, reservists, you retain all that freedom and kind of more control over your life, but sometimes there's money to pay you to fly and sometimes there's not. So uh, pe uh, people starting out trying to get hours, uh, it, it can be unpredictable. But it's been nothing but positive to me because there's almost always a deployment opportunity, always a travel opportunity, and um, the growth. The, there's the growth to me. I think seems easier as a reservist as far as getting promotions and opportunities. I haven't had anybody in my family or my son's friends that are like, real curious about what we do. But what I have encountered is they. It seems mystifying to them. Like, well, what you do is, like, how do you do that? Or that's why they, they think it's a lot more, I think, just difficult and special than it actually is. And I'm not saying it's not a hard goal to achieve and that the skills aren't, you know, I think we haven't worked really hard, but it's right. accessible mm -hmm. to anyone. There's a very simple course of actions that you would need to go to to become a pilot, a commercial pilot, a military pilot. Captain Sarah Kassman, pilot. If you have a gold mind, just kind of, it's pretty overwhelming. No one just accidentally becomes a pilot. Like it's always, it's a long process and the way to kind of handle it all is to take the next logical step forward. Like I, I was actually a medical officer first. I had like 90 hours in a little Cessna 152 and I was getting tired of it. I was sitting at a desk all day, but I was thinking it was too late to become a pilot. Um, but I just took the next logical step. I was like, well, I might as well ask around. So I just made a few phone calls and then they're like, oh yeah, it's okay, you can still do it. Just get these, uh, these tests done and turn in these performance reports and it's a total doable thing. You just have to not be afraid to go out for uh, getting that goal and asking for help if you need it. I would encourage uh, girls to get involved into sports because I actually find that aviation and being a pilot, you're actually, it's like being an athlete, like it's performance based and it's really, uh, it's a stressful situation. You're in stressful situations sometimes and I found that uh, just having a sports background and having that 
a little bit of a mental toughness, mental edge. Whatever girls want to study is fine, but also don't be intimidated by something because your skill set isn't limited to what you're initially good at. You can work at something and get better. You're not, mm -hmm. you're not, what's the word, like necessarily just bad at math. Like you can work at it and be yeah. good at math. Or science. You just have to have the persistence, yeah. I think, and that that key that's a key characteristic to being mm -hmm. successful. My name is Major Monica Riggs. I am an instructor pilot here at uh, McConnell Air Force Base in Wichita, Kansas, on the KC-135. Been flying this bird for about 11 years, and here at McConnell for five. Um, I'm a Kansas native and live here. Um, have been a Kansas native and live here in Wichita now with my husband and three daughters. Um, also at the 931st, I sit as the chief pilot, where I'm in charge of all of our hiring for our new applicants and um, pilot candidates as we prepare to bring the KC-46 uh, online here at McConnell. One of the most fun events that we got to do over the past year was the air show here at McConnell. Um, and we had the women in aviation booth set up and I, um, I showed up as Mrs. Kansas wearing that hat that day with the sash and crown. And it was so fun to watch the other girls setting there or standing there chit chatting with the little girls and boys that would come up and we'd be talking and they would see, you know, it was bright and sunny out. So the crown was sparkling and they would say, you know what, she flies the airplane too. And it was so fun to watch their little eyes light up and kind of that moment for them that said, Oh, guess what? Honestly, I can do both. Wherever you're at, just head out to your local airport on a bright, sunny summer morning, and I guarantee you there's going to be somebody out there that wants to talk airplanes, whether it's Women in Aviation or it's 99s or um, the Young Eagles program. Summer's coming, so there's tons of STEM events coming up. Um, your colleges and your and your your local areas are great places to start. I know um, WSU does some really amazing STEM camps. Um, that are just two-day camps, but can just really spark that interest from a young age is when it all starts. Um, you'll hear a lot of pilots say that they were watching the sky from a very young age, so it's a great time to capture it and just really breathe that enthusiasm. Getting to do the flight today with all these ladies really just brings everything together, and you know, if one little girl sees it and says, you know what, mom or dad or whoever, this is what I want to do, then we have done for that individual what someone did for us in able um, enabling them to dream bigger than the thought that they could and to chase their chase their wings, whether they be on the ground or in the sky. Technical Sergeant Sergio Danis, I'm an in-flight refueler. I didn't even know what a boom operator was when I was growing up. I got about two years of college done and I decided I wanted to do something that seemed like it would give back and be important. And I went and talked to a recruiter and told him I wanted to fly on an airplane. Hold on. If you have a large, we call offload, with a, a heavy receiver, then you could be back here. And say they uh, they aren't very good, you know, you could be back here for an hour. Um, if you're doing a training mission and you're just cycling pilots through the receiver so they can all get a chance, then um, I've done like four hour ARs before. But if you just have a light offload and say like a fighter type, you might just be back here for like 20 minutes. So yeah, it just depends on what you're doing. Yeah, so I had a full ride scholarship to an associate college. So I got my two years out of the way and uh, I didn't come from money for lack of better terminology there. Um, so the Air Force, th there was no way I was gonna go direct to like a flight school or anything like that, but I wanted to, um, like I said, I wanted to be on airplanes and I also had exposure to the military. So if the two could collide, that would be great. And, uh, and they did. So my dad retired from the Marine Corps and um, he likes to make fun of me a lot, but he invites me out. He's an instructor for the young Marines and he'll invite me out most years to talk to them. And I've essentially poached some of his students because uh, <laughs> I talk about the Air Force and I talk about what I do and they're like, wait, that's an option? The Marines is cool, but I think I'm gonna do that instead. I'm uh, Airman First Class Maricela Perez. I'm an aircraft structural maintenance. I work on the jet, um, maintaining it, and I also paint it. Um, my stepfather is retired Marine, and my uncle is 
uh, I think it was Army National Guard, and then my grandfather, I don't remember which branch of the military he was in. When I was younger, my aunt, she got me and my cousins into writing the military people. So we would write them letters. And I think that was kind of my moment. I am Master Sergeant Elizabeth Sarabia. Um, I am a non-destructive inspection technician. That we x-ray certain parts of the of the aircraft. Uh, we do, um, they teach us how to apply certain inspection methods to the aircraft to find cracks. Um, I have a cousin here and there that was in the Army, uh, in the Marines, but as far as the Air Force goes, I'm actually the first one in my family to, to join the Air Force. I knew that my cousin was in the Army and so that kind of sparked the idea. Uh, but it was honestly, it was it was kind of a, a random thought. It was it it, it sounded cool, and um, and I'm really glad I pursued it. If you if you believe you can do it, and if you want to do it, if it is in you, then then you should definitely pursue it. That's your um, if you feel it's your calling, then don't let the fact that you're a female or any other barrier stop you. I'm senior airman Olivia Mitchum. I am a aircraft metals technologist, so I make parts for the aircraft and I weld and machine parts for the aircraft. Um, yes, both my grandparents did, um, my grandfathers, they both were in the Air Force as well, and so, yeah, I, um, they don't talk about it much. I know my grandpa, um, on my dad's side was in, in 1950, and I know that my grandpa on my mom's side also served, but it was hard for him to talk about. For me, it was like a idea on my own, and it was something I wanted to do for the um, education benefits. And when I brought it up to my grandfather, he um, he did get very excited for me. And then later that year, he um, had taken his life, and I had to go two days after to MEP. So yeah, he was a big inspiration to me for that. Uh, Tech Sergeant Ann Phillips. I am a jet engine quality assurance inspector. With the KC-135, my job is to ensure that all safe, compliant maintenance is happening both on the flight line and in the back shops. Um, I predominantly focus on the engines themselves and the uh, auxiliary power systems. However, I am a cross-utilization trained crew chief as well, so I am qualified to inspect on any um, general airframe uh, type of maintenance actions that are happening, okay. uh, launch and recovery efforts, uh, as well as the pre, post, through, and quick turn inspections that happen on the flight line. Okay. My, my family is pretty deep-seated with military heritage. Uh, both my grandfather and my great uncle were in World War II. My great uncle, in fact, was a prisoner of war captured by the Nazis during the Battle of the Bull. When I was in high school, my grades weren't all pretty and sharp and everything, and um, my geometry teacher actually was the one that encouraged me to join the Air Force. He himself an Air Force vet and uh, motivated me to do it because it would get me out of our small podunk town in eastern Oregon. Um, it afforded me the opportunity to travel, college benefits. He's like, you have, you're, you're too big for this small town. You know, you need to get out. I'm pre 9/11, and I was actually in basic training when 9/11 happened. And um, you know, you you walk in to the military uh, pre 9/11, and it was, oh, you know, world's kind of calm right now. Everything's sunshine and roses. And then you're standing there one day and the TIs turn on the TV screen and you're watching the Twin Towers collapsing to the ground and your whole world has just changed. So what started as me joining the Air Force to get college benefits and to see the world turned into a duty to serve my nation and to protect it literally from all enemies for an individual. Having to juggle the job and my kids has always been somewhat of a challenge and my ex-husband's actually active duty too so you throw in deployments in there right. you throw in TDYs in there and thankfully my ex and I have a wonderful relationship we've just always been there to support one another and help with the kids but there's times when you know he got sent on a year-long uh, tour to Korea and I had no help and I was working full-time 
with both the kids, with my daughter, with all of her challenges, uh, just something about having the consistency of work and the job that I love doing and that I know very, very well has helped actually stabilize my life. It is the one source of stability I do have in an otherwise chaotic life. And I'll actually use a story about Sergeant Sarabia here. Um, we were deployed together and uh, it was over my oldest daughter's birthday and I was gutted because I had never missed my children's birthday ever in their life and it was my daughter's 10th birthday and we were in Turkey together. I'm sorry, we were deployed together. <laughs> and uh, anyways, I uh, wanted to do something special for my daughter and the best we could come up with was we were going to bake a cake and we were gonna FaceTime my daughter and all of the girls that we all lived with all saying her happy birthday. And this one right here, she made sure that I um, was able to celebrate my daughter's birthday with her from afar and she she baked the cake she decorated it and everything and uh, and then of course when we got back uh, her and my daughter got to meet and it's funny because my oldest daughter is actually taller than her <laughs> but it, it was just it was one of those things that you know my daughter was able to relate that person this person right here was the one that decorated that cake for you when we were deployed together, and so Miss Lisa, as she's known as in my house, is a, is a part of our family essentially now. Like we know Miss Lisa, we're and so she she supported me. Yeah, very much a sisterhood. Like she she's got my back through a lot of things. We call each other for work support, personal support. My name is Abigail Klein. I am a tech sergeant or E6 with the 931st Air Fueling Public Affairs Office. I always feel honored when they allow me to document the work that they do because it's the boom pod is not very big, <laughs> um, so it's it's kind of an understanding between you and the boom operator. In this case, it was Tech Sergeant Dennis. Um, it's kind of an understanding of I want her to be able to do the best job she can still, but I also want to do justice by taking a good photograph and documenting the job that she's doing. So for me. Um, there's that element that I have to always take into consideration and then once we kind of get into the flow of it and I can kind of see how she's air fueling, it's always interesting for me. It's, I definitely have a, the less stressful job in that moment, um, but I, you know, I, I can't even tell you, I think this is probably my 12th flight and I've been in about 12 years and every single one of them is different. And I guess the feeling I get is just, it's always really, it's still amazing to me what they can do and in such a small space. In public affairs, which can be done outside of the Air Force, you're imparting an ideology. So the Air Force is a culture, it's a lifestyle. It's my job to be the liaison between the Air Force and the public. And we do this via written products, visual products, uh, video products, and also community relations and media relations. So our job is basically just to impart what the Air Force is doing, what taxpayers' dollars are going into, and making it more uh, tangible to everyday people that aren't in the Air Force. Um, I came from a, both an active duty and reserve background. I did active duty for about six years and then transitioned right over to the reserves is the family aspect of it. In active duty, you do get close with each other. You form a bond with each other, working together, deploying together. But it's nice in the reserves that that bond, that rapport you build with somebody can last almost as many as five years. I mean, you were talking to Major Riggs earlier, she's been here five years. I've been with the unit for six. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jones has been with the unit for almost 20. So that's something that you cannot get in the active duty that is ever present in the reserves. It's just that stability and that family aspect of supporting each other and wanting the best for each other and working together to complete the Air Force mission. It doesn't matter if you're a maintainer, it doesn't matter if you you know, work in the commissary, it's, we're all working towards the same goal and I feel like I get a better sense of that since I've been in the reserves than I did when I was active duty. I didn't see myself in a uniform ever when I was in high school or as a young teenager, but when I did join, 
I found out that there's so many different people from so many different backgrounds and it literally is basic training of any service is the greatest equalizer. You're meeting everybody from a different socioeconomic background, educational background, and you're all in it together just to get through the experience and to become service members. So I, I would say if you're intimidated by it just because you maybe don't have a family member that has familiarized you with it, I would still say it's not as scary as you think. It, it, they, the military makes you a better individual. It doesn't matter where you come from. It makes you a stronger person overall. Obviously the JET doesn't care, uh, male or female, it's there to get the mission done, but it is always exciting when we can all sit down um, together as, as a bunch of females and, and work together to um, empower each other and get that mission done safely and successfully. So. Um, a few of the girls, I've flown with actually all the girls on the crew at different points throughout our careers, but we've never been able to marry it up on one sortie, so that was a lot of fun. And uh, hopefully as time moves forward, these numbers keep growing and it becomes um, not so much of a an event, but just a normal daily occurrence. If you would have asked me in high school if I'd be sitting here in front of you in a uniform, I would have honestly thought you were crazy. And here we are all these late year, years later, and now I'm, I'm hiring into these positions, and so it's a ton of fun. Um, I just recently was at the Women in Aviation Conference and was able to give a presentation to probably 75 or 100 um, girls and guys that came in um, and it was entitled The Road to Wings. So we went through that process and what it looks like. But the biggest thing is don't let, don't let that stereotype or don't let something that you perceive to be a limit of yourself block you. If it's something that you want to do, go for it. If it's flying the airplane, if it's turning a wrench on the airplane, if it's learning the ins and outs of the avionics so that we can again affect a successful mission. Um, go for it. If someone tells you no, go to the next person and ask them. Um, just keep pushing until you get to that goal and that dream and don't, don't let your own perceptions of yourself limit your success.